Okay, welcome to Refuge Recovery World Services, first Thursday teaching, offering. Uh, just a reminder, anybody that's new to this first Thursday format, uh, welcome to you. And um, this is not a Refuge Recovery meeting. Refuge Recovery meetings are peer-led and uh, are based on, on the book only on the book and, um, and our personal experience with, with recovery. This first Thursday is uh, a teacher-led uh, offering where I might refer to the book some, but also I might go in some other Buddhist teaching directions that aren't directly uh, out of the book. So welcome to you. We're going to, uh, I'm going to talk about uh, my topic for tonight for this week is um, renunciation. Giving up, uh, letting go, abstaining. And we're gonna talk about the importance of renunciation beyond, um, beyond just the primary addictions beyond just, you know, we renounce drugs and alcohol and, and behaviors. And I wanna have some discussion tonight around uh, bottom lines for process addictions, how we have to create our own bottom lines and adhere to them as part of our recovery process. So for the meditation, you know, renunciation is also part of our, our meditation on some levels. Uh, we take the seat and we say, I'm gonna sit here for this amount of time, 20 minutes or 30 minutes or 40 minutes. And I'm gonna renounce uh, moving. I'm gonna actually try to sit still. I'm going to um, renounce. I'm gonna try not to. I'm gonna uh, do my best to abstain from thinking about the future or the past a form of renunciation of I'm gonna try to not plan. My mind might continue to do that, but I'm gonna try not to be involved in the planning and in the remembering. And uh, I'm gonna renounce that uh, identification and involvement with my mind and try to take the stance of awareness. Being aware of what the mind is doing, being mindful of what the body is feeling, what emotions are here, what thoughts are coming um, without thinking. And this is a, an interesting uh, dilemma for us of uh, knowing that thoughts are gonna continue during meditation, but to not get involved in the thoughts and that there's a difference between volitional, intentional thinking on purpose. I'm sitting here and I'm thinking about something intentionally planning it, remembering it, fantasizing about it, volitionally, intentionally. And so we're trying to renounce that kind of thought while at the same time accepting that non-volitional thoughts will come. That Buddhist mindfulness meditation is not about stopping the mind. And maybe it's not even really quite possible to stop the mind. And this is an important reminder for everybody who comes to meditation with that idea that like a good meditation is where there's no thoughts. From a Buddhist mindfulness perspective, a good meditation is when you're aware of all of the thoughts arising and passing and you're not engaging in them, but you just watch them arise and pass, arise and pass. Planning, remembering, hope, fear, craving, aversion, and they're just passing through awareness without I am in it. I am involved in it. Just knowing it here, it's here. And that's part of the long-term process of mindfulness. So part of our renunciation as a frame for as we, we're gonna sit here now in a few minutes. And um, as you take your meditation posture, the intention to renounce volitional thinking, 
Try not to intentionally get involved with your thoughts. Keep coming back to the body, to the breath, to the mind, here and now. One of the chapters in our book talks about um, breaking the addiction to our minds. That although we come to refuge recovery because we've become drug addicts or alcoholics or food addicts or sex addicts or money or relationships, codependent, addicted to people. When they, you know, we have our, uh, what in the other program they call our qualifiers. <laughs> I'm qualified for recovery because I'm an alcoholic, because I'm a drug addict, because I'm a codependent. But that ultimately, it's not the substances, it's not the behaviors. It's obeying our own mind that we're mostly addicted to. It's not the cravings, it's the satisfying of the cravings, it's the believing them, it's the impulsively and compulsively acting on the cravings, that's the problem. That's the addiction that leads to all of the harm, the suffering that we experience. So part of the renunciation that we're going for, and then we're gonna talk about the other forms afterwards, but in the meditation, renouncing identification with the mind. The mind is not your fault. And the thoughts that arise are actually optional. You can choose, and we all see this. You meditate for a little while, you start to see, I can choose whether I'm involved in that thought or I choose to bring my attention back to the sensations, whether I redirect, I disengage from those thoughts. Thoughts continue in the background, but I choose to come back ground in the first foundation, mindfulness of the body, breathing. Breaking our addiction to obeying our minds. So find a way to sit that's upright and relaxed and we'll meditate for about 20 minutes. You have some instructions. Allowing your eyes to be closed, your body to be relaxed, releasing any tension that's being held around the eyes, jaw, shoulders, belly, softening anywhere else that is unnecessarily tense. Allow the breath to breathe itself. No need to control the breath. No need to deep, to breathe deeply. Just let the upright, relaxed body breathe as you bring awareness, mindfulness to the sensations associated with breathing. Feel the posture, contact with the chair, the cushion, the couch. Mindfulness receives the six sense doors, the thoughts in the mind, the sounds, smells, tastes. It's 
seeing and feeling sensations in the body. And we can learn to direct our awareness, choosing what we focus our mindfulness on. We start with choosing to focus the attention in the body with the breath, letting everything else, especially the thoughts, be in the background. Disengaging from the thinking mind, bringing an attitude of kindness, friendliness, To the, aware, to the awareness of the body breathing. The Buddha's initial meditation instructions were something like, breathing in, one knows I breathe in. Breathing out, one knows I breathe out. And if the breath is deep, we know it's a deep breath or shallow or long or short. Investigating and accepting the body's breath patterns just as they are. And the attention gets drawn into thinking. Just acknowledge it. The mind is thinking, no judgment. Be kind to the mind without indulging in it. Choose to come back to the body sitting. Feel your hands resting in your lap. It doesn't stop the thoughts. 
but we stop paying attention to them as we redirect our attention to the body and the sensations of the breath. Perhaps noting in as you breathe in and out as you breathe out. over and over disengaging from the thinking mind, returning to the feeling body. Renounce thinking, take refuge in feeling in the body. Each breath anchoring us to this present moment. having established mindfulness of the body and breath, opening to the feeling tone, pleasant, unpleasant, and neutral of the breath, of the sensations in the body. Opening to the sense doors of hearing, Seeing, smelling, tasting.
and how these sense doors, sense impressions also have a feeling tone, every sound, every smell, every taste, every sight being perceived as pleasant or unpleasant, or neutral. And the repetitive craving, the second noble truth, the repetitive craving for pleasant sensations, pleasant sounds, pleasant images, pleasant thoughts. Opening to the mind itself with the intention to observe thought rather than think them. Watch how the mind thinks all by itself. As you bring awareness, turn your attention towards your mind. Thoughts coming out of nowhere and dissolving into nothing as they arise and pass through awareness. Ultimately, mindfulness is fully inclusive, waking us up to the impermanent nature of thought and emotion and sensation. Everything that arises, passes, changes, dissolves. We see more and more clearly how our suffering is created by the clinging to the pleasant, the aversion to the pain, and the identification with what the mind is doing when we take it personal, when we believe that we are our thoughts. A self-centeredness that creates so much sorrow. As we break our addiction, we renounce taking it all so personal, we experience more and more freedom. And 
more and more sense of well-being and ease, even in the midst of difficult mind states. Whenever you're ready, allowing your eyes to be open, bringing attention back to the computer in front of you, the Zoom Sangha. One of the ways that I've thought about and experienced recovery um, is that there's there's the um, the renunciation and there's the cultivation, or we could uh, say this in a simple way: is uh, what are we subtracting from our lives, and what are we adding to our lives? What are we cultivating? What are we adding? What are we practicing that we weren't practicing before? For most of us, this isn't true for everybody, but for most of us, um, we add meetings, <laughs> involvement in community and meetings. I'm going to add that and, and community in, in that way, um, developing what we call Sangha community. Um, going to add meditation a disciplined mind training, investigation, developing the heart practices, developing mindfulness. I'm going to add that. Now, this isn't true for everybody. I hear some members say, like, I was meditating for years while I was practicing alcoholic <laughs> or, you know, marijuana addict or whatever. So there are many people who were meditating during their addiction. But I, most of us, weren't very serious about our meditation, uh, if we were, and we come in and we add that. We say, okay, now I'm entering this recovery path and process and meetings and community and meditation practice, and we add um, service work, uh, volunteerism, helping each other, mentoring each other. Um, and again, some of you maybe were very much engaged in service and activism and um, as during active addiction. And so it's not new, it's just new to do it in this form. So there's all of these, you know, things that we're adding, we're adding studying. Um, you know, some of you already were familiar with Buddhism before you joined us here in Refuge Recovery, and some of you weren't. I think there's a lot of people in Refuge Recovery that just show up here because they know their investigation of the 12 steps left them wanting something different than that, and so they check this out, not aware of, not very aware of Buddhism, but it sounded like a good non-theistic alternative to the 12-step process, and, and so then you're here and you're adding all of this new language, sangha, what's that mean? <laughs> Karma, uh, you know, some of, some of these words are 
in our culture already. Some of them are new to, to some of you. And what do we renounce? Um, in uh, the beginning of our text, we have a definition of renunciation. And it's quite short and concise. And it says, renunciation is the practice of abstaining from harmful behaviors. We renounce harmful behaviors. On page uh, 55, at the beginning of the chapter eight on um, action and engagement. The first sentence says, we abstain from all substances and behaviors that could lead to suffering. So this is where the refuge recovery path, the Buddhist path, um, is asking for a lot more than just physical sobriety. The Buddha's teaching that is this grand promise of it's possible to end all of the suffering in our lives in this lifetime, that it's actually possible to have so much mindfulness of the impermanent, impersonal, an unsatisfactory nature of all phenomena and that we respond with non-attachment and compassion to such a level that we don't suffer even about our pain anymore is this path that we're on. And part of that is taking a, a mindful investigation, a clear look, a, you know, we do these in-depth inventories to really uncover and unearth all of the ways that we've been suffering and causing suffering, causing harm to others. And it's a part of our path to make a strong commitment to stop, to abstain, to renounce behaviors substances and behaviors that cause us, that harm us or harm others. Now there's a couple of issues that I'm aware of in refuge recovery. One is the issue of um, the Uh, you know, addicts who say, well, I had a primary, primary addiction or a drug of choice. Uh, the alcoholic who says, well, I wasn't addicted to marijuana, so I want to quit drinking, but I want to smoke weed. It's legal anyways, right? So you hear that. Not that legality has anything to do with anything, <laughs> but you hear that in recovery. Um, the you know opiate addict who says i'm not an alcoholic it's the opiates that get me but i'm going to have a drink now and then the um, process addict the food addict you know who says i'm not a alcoholic uh, i need to stay away from certain kinds of food i need to stay away from sugar and I've become totally addicted to sugar or processed, you know, grains or, or something. And, and so I know, I know I need to renounce that, but I can have a drink once in a while because I'm not an alcoholic. Or the, you know, substance addict who uh, 
uh, sobers up alcoholic drug addict who you know gets clean uh, and then turns to sex as the next addiction or turns to food as the next addiction and says well yeah you know i'm i'm off of the heroin uh, and now i'm on the porn or i'm off of the alcohol and now i'm on the ice cream and You know, I feel um, like, of, of course, we need to be patient and gentle and accepting of ourselves and our own process. We need to be patient and gentle and accepting of others and their process. But it's also my job and all of our jobs to also be very clear that we don't have to stay stuck. We don't have to uh, stay stuck in any form of addiction. What Buddhism offers us, what refuge recovery offers us is a path of renunciation and cultivation to free us from all of the ways that we've been causing harm to ourselves. All of the ways that uh, anything that manifests as an addiction, we can recover, we can establish abstinence and renunciation. And for many people, it's a, it even says it's the practice of abstaining, not the perfection of abstaining, not the you'll never relapse again. But it's possible to not relapse. It's possible to have the kind of a renunciation where you say, you know, I'm just, you know, not going to drink. I'm not going to use drugs. I'm not going to eat sugar because I see the suffering that sugar created in my life. And so I'm going to practice renunciation. I will abstain from sugar. I will abstain from alcohol. I will abstain from drugs. I'll abstain from pornography, whatever it is. You know, this is where refuge is tricky because we're talking about all of them. It's a little easier when you're just talking about alcohol or you're just talking about we're talking about all of the manifestations, anything that you yourself, that we ourselves have identified as an addiction. Nobody's diagnosing anybody else. We don't get to look at somebody and say, you're an addict, even if it's true. <laughs> Recovery is for those of us who say, I'm an addict. I've become addicted. Uh, and even for those of us who are substance, primarily substance abuse, substance addicts, alcoholics, drug addicts, when we identify sugar as an addiction, then, you know, and, and or sex or pornography or gambling or codependency, people, I'm addicted to people. When we acknowledge that, then it's our responsibility to create our own bottom line behaviors. Some of the things we can be abstinent from. You know, my own sense is that the, the drug addicts and alcoholics have it the easiest. <laughs> it's fucking, you know, which is crazy to say because it's so hard to get off of drugs and alcohol, but you can actually quit and stay quit. You can. Food addiction, so much trickier because you have to keep eating. So that's where this term bottom line, you have to decide as part of my recovery from food addiction, I am going to abstain from A, B, and C. This is what is allowable to eat. And this is what is not allowable in order for me to consider myself in renunciation, in abstinence. You have to create your own bottom lines. And you have to be very clear about your own bottom lines and not, um, you know, say like, oh, well, I changed it. And, you know, bottom, from my understanding, bottom lines can change, but that's something that should be communicated and processed with a mentor, with someone else who has experience in that uh, recovery process. And they, it's not, you don't get to just choose like, well, you know, tonight, 
I'm going to, you know, totally relapse on sugar and not consider it a relapse. We have to be true to ourselves. Tonight, I'm going to totally relapse on pornography and, and pretend like I'm still abstinent or on people or on, um, and this is, you know, it's sort of beautiful because there's no external authority here. Each one of us has to be true to ourselves. There's no policing. There's no, <laughs> it's your recovery. It's your healing. It's your awakening. It's your path. And so you get to set your own bottom line and then you get to adhere to it. Yes, we need support. We need accountability. So uh, important to have Sangha, you know, community. So important to have the mentor that you're clear with. These are my bottom lines around food, around sex, around money, around relationships, people. And I want to be accountable to you. But it's not that person's job to call you out. It's your job to acknowledge. I relapsed. I'm going to start over. I'm going to start over because uh, I relapse and I'm going to keep going. And it's very intentional that in refuge recovery, we don't put emphasis on time. That I, I really wanted to avoid the hierarchy that gets created in recovery uh, programs of who has a lot of time abstinent, who doesn't, who's the newcomers because it's a bullshit false hierarchy. And there's a whole bunch of people with a lot of time that aren't very kind or compassionate or wise. And there's some people that are brand new that are so raw and vulnerable and kind and loving and wise. And if there's any hierarchy, as far as I'm concerned in the world, it's wisdom. It's not time abstinent. <laughs> You know, if there's any hierarchy, it's how compassionate are you? How friendly are you? How wise are you? How much are you aware of the causes of suffering? And how much are you alleviating those causes in your own life? That's what's important. Not, I've been sober for 20 years. Who gives a fuck? Unless it's actually been... 20 years of a meditation practice and a healing process that has brought you to a place of kindness and compassion and wisdom. And then you have that experience to pass on to people who are new. Wonderful then. I guess the reason I went on that tangent was because this whole thing about relapse is that it's not about starting over. It's just about acknowledging. And I might've even said the term starting over. I don't really have the, the right language for it but that it's a practice and it's an ongoing practice and that uh, we establish and maintain and reestablish and continue to maintain our renunciation. And I've been asked a lot of questions about like, well, what, what should my bottom lines be? I don't know what your bottom lines should be. Everyone has to create their own. And, you know, if food is the, uh, addiction, then you need to find someone else who's who's developed some successful renunciation and and healing and recovery around food. Uh, there's other you know food based addic you know addiction recovery programs who are very prescriptive and say, well, you're going to go on a food plan and you're going to weigh your food and you're only going to eat this food and this many you know protein and this many vegetables, this many carbohydrates, and, and you have to stick with that. Um, I don't see refuge recovery becoming that prescriptive when it comes to food. I think uh, people are going to have to find their own bottom lines and, and, and adhere to them and take it seriously and know that it's possible when it comes to sexuality, you know, you hear sometimes in sex addicts and love addicts where they, you know, there's this sort of like, well, I can't, I can't abstain. Uh, food you have to eat, sex you don't have to have. 
you know, we're practicing Buddhism, the Buddha celibate. <laughs> it's totally okay to not have sex. For the record, <laughs> celibacy is totally okay. Having sex, engaging in sexuality, a choice. A choice that most of us are making, and most of us are suffering the consequences of making the choice to not be celibate. From a Buddhist perspective, celibacy is way easier on the path to liberation than trying to skillfully navigate the craving, the attachment, and the consequences of craving and attachment in relationships. So my sense is that, you know, for, for sex addicts, again, you have to create your own bottom lines, but a period of abstinence is healthy. Um, although my own experience in recovery is really substance-based, uh, because I like Buddhism so much, I've practiced a lot of voluntary renunciation. Um, I've had two long periods of celibacy just to experiment with abstaining and renouncing sexuality. Uh, in my 20s, I spent two years completely celibate. And then a few years ago, I spent six months celibate just, just to dive into letting go of masturbation, letting go of pornography, letting go of sexual relationships, and to just be with a mind and body that's not uh, satisfying that desire, not engaging in those desires or cravings. I don't have experience really with food addiction, but I've been quite um, disciplined about what I eat and I don't eat at times in my recovery. I spent many years completely abstaining from sugar not eating any sugar. I spent many years totally abstaining from caffeine and nicotine and eating a plant-based diet and being very disciplined and, and uh, a lot of renunciation because we can do that. It's possible to do it if we want to. And, you know, if, if, as addicts, um, it's not just a want, like we need to. It's part of our recovery uh, if food or sex or has become an addiction. So the other issue that we run into uh, is, is the process addiction folks who say, I love refuge recovery. I love meditating and the Sangha and, and I'm not an alcoholic and I don't want to be told I can't drink. In uh, that same chapter in the book, it's addressed here on page 56, it says some addicts complain that they should be able to continue to indulge themselves if they were not addicted to a particular substance, like the alcoholic who wishes to smoke marijuana. Oh, that wasn't the piece I wanted to read. While recovering addicts may find reasons to complain about this abstinence-based approach, it's ultimately necessary because we are taking on a way of life that demands clarity and mindfulness. We follow in the footsteps of the Buddha, and he was clear about the necessity of a fully sober mind in order to awaken and recover our true nature. Yes, this approach asks a lot of us, and it also promises a lot. Not just a return to the normal suffering of the non-addict's life, but a spiritual awakening, a life of freedom from suffering altogether. I think the only, you know, again, we're not trying to police anybody, but we are clear that if you're in a service position, if you're a secretary or a group rep, um, that maintaining abstinence from one's bottom line behaviors and or any kind of recreational drugs and alcohol is necessary because you're the face of the meeting. And if you're in active addiction, um, with your not following your bottom line behaviors, or if you're, um, you know, not abstaining, not practicing the 
uh, the precept of avoiding recreational drugs and alcohol, uh, you're opening the door for others and it could be very harmful to others in the group, even if it seems to not be so harmful to you. So some thoughts um, about renunciation, the importance of renunciation. One more thing, and then if there's any questions or discussion, we could have some discussion. Um, you can break the eightfold path down. Traditionally, sometimes the eightfold path is broken into three sections. Uh, wisdom, the first two sections of the eightfold path is the wisdom section, coming to understand the truth of karma coming to understand cause and effect and, and the importance of forgiveness and compassion. The second piece around uh, making sure that our intentions are wise, are skillful, are, are free from uh, trying to cause harm. The middle section, what we call communication and community, action and livelihood are all about ethical way of living renouncing unethical behavior, renouncing harmful behavior, whether that's at work or through our speech or our actions or with our sexuality. Um, renunciation is the central three factors of the path. And then effort, mindfulness, and concentration being the, the meditative uh, cultivation. And mindfulness can't be separated from any of this because we have to be mindful of our speech, of our actions, of our mind that's saying, hey, you should eat that, <laughs> or you should drink that, or you should watch that. Mindfulness, as we did tonight, is so much the intervention where we can say, oh, look at that craving arising. I better call somebody. Look at that thought that my mind is, that craving that my mind is trying to talk me into. And if we can, just watching it arise and pass, great. If not, sometimes the intervention is community, is connection, is, is talking to uh, others, letting someone else, uh, you know, hold our hand through that craving that we've identified rather than reacting to it and obeying it and relapsing. So what are your thoughts, questions, comments? James, go ahead. Thank Can you. I, yep. Thank you very much. Um, I really appreciated hearing what you had to say today and um, agreed with so much of it. Uh, there's two quibbles that I, well, one quibble and one um, uh, disagreement. Uh, the quibble I have is, is we're talking about the mind as though it's a homogenous thing. And um, I, it served my recovery quite well to think of, you know, the amygdala is not the same as the frontal lobe, and there's many components to our minds. And mm -hmm. it's the, my mind is my friend when I'm mindful. It's my ego that is not my amigo. And when I can detach from my ego, my recovery is so much easier. And when I'm in, in, involved with my ego, when my ego is running the show, all of my behaviors are are no longer serving myself or my community. So I would like that distinction uh, to be made. And I try to make it every time this, this people complain about their minds, right. uh, you know, because it's not just one thing. That's my quibble. And the part I take exception with what you're saying is when you're talking about service, I look at the website and it says there's abstinence suggestions. And what people, what I've heard in groups is that and you know, we have these policemen, we have these cops who think it's not, it's a service requirement, not a suggestion. And I have seen them do harm in yeah. their self-appointed roles as cops uh, to people who have process addictions, who have a mimosa with their family at brunch on a Sunday. And then they say they can't be in a service position. This does harm. It, I've yeah. seen people reduced to tears. And they do it in your name, Noah. They say, that's what Noah says. So I would like you to tell us that this is really up to the group to decide. These are the suggestions because we are not saints and we are not aspiring. We well, maybe aspire to, but we are not at the level of becoming 
Buddha. I am not. And I don't, I don't pretend that I am. Yeah. I am no saint. And I am not a guru. I'm a human being stuck in this human body. And I do the best I can to recover and to help those around me recover. And it ties my hands to be helpful when the, the police are saying, you cannot be a service. Service is an integral part of our recovery. I agree. I don't know exactly um, what to do about this piece. Um, it is a, currently it's, it's, it's um, abstinence is not a suggestion when it comes to secretaries. It's a part of the essential elements that anybody who's in that role is agreeing to practice uh, abstinence and model abstinence. Um, so it's not just a suggestion, it's, it's an essential uh, agreement that if you're a secretary, you're practicing abstinence. Um, but how it's handled is really important. And that's the part that kind of hurts my heart when I hear that is being handled in a way that is not skillful, that is causing harm. And, and my sense is, um, of course, it should be group conscience. There shouldn't be any individual uh, police officer, <laughs> karma cops, uh, you know, especially invoking my name and saying like, well, Noah said so. Um, I have said so. I've been quite clear about the importance of abstinence, especially for the, those, you know, in the service, those service positions. Um, and quite clear about the, the fact that this is an abstinence program and that, um, you know, mimosas are not part of our process and that this is, you know, not something that I made up. This, this is the teachings of the Buddha. Um, this is the fifth precept of, of Buddhism, which is to maintain complete abstinence from all recreational mimosas at weddings. <laughs> And, you know, people don't have to be good Buddhists or, you know, don't have to do this. Uh, everybody gets, is totally in choice about how they relate to it. Um, and I'm not even sure that it's right to have this essential element that you have to uh, be practicing the fifth precepts to be a secretary. Um, but I put it in there, we put it in there because we were in, in early days of refuge recovery, there were people that were really clearly not sober, secretary meetings and nodding and be, you know, and glorifying. And so we had to put in there like, no, you actually need to be sober to secretary a meeting. <laughs> um, and I know that's not the full uh, of it and, and that there's more to it, but you know, if this issue comes up, my sense is um, should be taken uh, to a business meeting and a group conscience should be had and not an individual, um, you know, member shouldn't be saying like, hey, you're out. It should be brought to a business meeting and discussed in as a loving and gentle way as possible. And if it's discussed in a loving and gentle way, the person who's choosing to not practice abstinence might still be really hurt by that and uh, or offended or disagree with it. But that's what we are doing here. We are an abstinence-based program. And to be in that role, you need to be practicing abstinence. That's where we're at right now with it. Uh, Michael, go ahead. Hello, yeah, thanks, Noah. Um... Thanks for for the the comments and the the meditation. And uh, I I logged in a couple minutes uh, late, and you were talking about choices, and I, uh, I I it really resonated to me, especially when you also mentioned um, well that, there was a filling tone uh, meditation that I did last night at a meeting, and uh, I was really appreciating the um, the opportunity after being in three years in recovery to be able to feel different stuff and not to be obeying my craving, as you mentioned, because generally, you know, what was happening is whatever was coming up uh, for me in, during my addiction in terms of emotion, I didn't want to feel that. So 
um, you know, I'd grab a drink generally. Um, and what was super cool when I, you know, it's still really cool, but, but, but the realization that I had choices, um, was just awesome. You know, it really kind of amped up my commitment to recovery when, when it was like, man, I don't have to drink. I'm choosing not to drink. You know, I can choose to do other things or I could, you know, the idea that you're not a slave to a craving anymore was just liberating. And, you know, then I can kind of deepen my practice and pay attention to more and more nuanced parts of uh, uh, different, you know, uh, meditations. But um, it, there was a, a, a phrase that I heard recently, and it, it, it touches upon um, what you were talking about earlier is it just simply pay attention to your attention. And I thought that was, wow, how simple is that? But how perfect that is. It's like, and I started actually practicing it. It's like, you know, if you, there's these apps that track your usage of different apps on um, your computer. It's like, oh, I spent 3.7 hours on the internet. I, you know, played uh, 20 minutes of Scrabble. And, and it's funny because then you could look at that and go, wow, you could see where your, you know, internet usage is. But to apply that to your, your waking life is a truly cool concept. So, yeah, I just wanted to thank you and um, thank everyone here for their wisdom as well. And, you know, uh, highlighting that idea is pay attention to your attention. Thank you. Yeah, great. Thanks, Michael. Greg, go ahead. We'll do the Greg will be the last one for tonight. You need to unmute yourself still, bro. Am I unmuted now? Yeah, I think so. Um, by the way, I, I went to Los Angeles and lived at the Lux Sunset Boulevard, actually, for seven months in 2017 into 2018. And that's how I was introduced to you um, and your meetings, which were transformational for me. Um, I've, I did AA, but it, that was okay. But I just feel like refuge was just i don't know um better i i am trying to use a more sophisticated word but um it the community was terrific um i went down to santa monica i went to the other place in hollywood i think or somewhere i, I forget because <laughs> this was in 2017 2018 and um what you have done um with your work has been really important in my life uh, I have I have four children. Actually, I say four in the field, uh, one in the stands because we lost one. Um, but I came out to LA after getting separated from my wife and then divorced, um, and had a you know wonderful woman in my life in LA who's still in my life. Um, and um, this, like, listening to your words tonight, it makes me think about a lot of things. And the one thing I want to share, and I'll I'll, I'll keep it brief. Um, because I know everyone needs to go. <laughs> but the one thing that I've, it's been interesting, and I would really love to hear your perspective on this or anyone who wants to contribute, um, is I grew up in this world where I went to, you know, kind of, you know, really good schools and, uh, and you know, was a, you know, had Goldman Sachs, and now I'm building, you know, um, controlled environment agricultural farms, you know, and, um, but I've been out in the world more, whether it was LA or here in Montauk, Long Island, where I am now. And I'm about to be in Texas and Arizona and South Africa. And, and the broader world, it can be a little rough. And I'm tough, like, you know, uh, but it's, it's a little bit a less of a controlled environment, if you will. So you interact with people who can be, you know, difficult, potentially harmful. Again, I'm not fearful uh, at all, but it does, you know, sometimes trigger me a little bit. And I've been able to maintain my sobriety. My issue was alcohol. It's not anymore. But, um, you know, uh, do you have any thoughts? Like when, I'll give you an example. I went in to watch the sunset tonight and this guy just came up to me and got in my, you know, I just bought this truck, whatever. He just got in my face for no reason. And I'm like, what are you doing? 
like, you know, do you want to hit me? <laughs> I know BJJ. So if you want to do that, you're going to be on the wrong end of this situation. But the point is what, like when you deal with the broader society and you want to keep your sobriety, uh, any thoughts on handling that reality? I mean, I feel like I, pr I appreciate your, your comments and it's good to see you, Greg. And um, I don't know, I feel like the kind of general platitudes that I'm going to give you aren't going to be that helpful. Uh, maybe I can share my own experience, which is um, the more I'm kind of aware of my own like, you know, like that experience of sitting in the truck and when we're being mindful of like, oh, this is a really unpleasant interaction. And we're re relating mindfully to, oh, this is unpleasant. And I feel like kind of the trigger of, you know, getting tough, getting kind of <laughs> defensive, getting, uh, yeah. Right. So the more we can be mindful of that and remind ourselves, actually, I'm trying to train my mind to be compassionate to see this person, this difficult person in society, whether it's this person that's giving you a hard time or some of the political stuff that has so many of us stirred up um, through the eyes of compassion of to see like, oh, there's ignorance abounds, confusion abounds. Um, <coughs> half, the, half the country likes Trump. I mean, think about that, but anyway, go on. Exactly. <laughs> um, and being able to, try to come from a perspective of, of compassion. And you know, one of the things that Buddhism teaches us, and I don't think I really address this in, in refuge because I don't want to get too political, but um, Buddhism sees this world, the Buddha saw this world. He called it samsara, a realm of, of greed and hatred and delusion. And that actually ignorance is the status quo and completely normal here. And so that's where we have to sort of check ourselves when we're thinking like, well, how dare you be ignorant? <laughs> how dare you be unskillful or, or have, yeah. these, you know, so just, just re reframing it of like, this is the norm. Like we live in this world of greed and hatred and delusion, and we're trying to be the opposite. We're trying to be generous and compassionate and loving and forgiving and, you know, and present with, you know, aware of awareness. <laughs> and we're on this really radical path that is not mirrored by the world. It's one of the reasons why Sangha is so fucking important that we have the people in our lives that actually get it oh, you're trying to be kind and compassionate and loving and forgiving and mindful and dedicate your life to service. We need to be mirrored by the people who get what we're trying to do, who are also trying to do that. And so there's that. By the way, we got to let go of any idea that um, people are going to act right <laughs> in this um, world. They're by the just way, not. That, 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 that is that is, I don't know if I'm muted or not. I think not. Um, I, that is so well said. Like, I'm just walking through this less protected world right now, if you will. You know, I used to travel in this circle that was all organized and so forth. And now I'm traveling in the real world. Yeah. And what I'm interacting with is sometimes it feels crazy. Yeah. And um, so you're, the, the word compassion that you uh, just surfaced. I'm going to, I'm going to put that on my forehead. Like, you know, like just, you know what? Um, I know that I'm, you know, I want to be loving and, and a nice person. I care about my children and all those in my world and my life that I love and everyone. Yeah. So if you're going to, you know, be difficult with me, I'm just going to back away and go on with my day. You know, I don't know what else to do. Like, you know, it's like the um, otherwise it ends up being. There's a teaching, the loving kindness teaching from the Buddha. Uh, and at one point he says, um, radiate kindness on all living beings and cherish all living beings the way that the ideal mother, the ideal parent would 
would treasure and protect their own children. So, you know, think of, um, you know, your political uh, enemies with that kind of kindness and as though they're your own confused children. Think of the, you know, difficult interactions that you have, somebody approaching you or insulting you of your, you know, think, try to think of it as like your kid throwing a fit and saying, hey, fuck you, dad. And, you know, hopefully well, you're happy to be today. Yeah. I and hopefully you're, people. hopefully you're going to be patient and tolerant and not be like, how did, you know, not hit them, you know, it's so. Not, well, I would never hit anybody. So but, think, you know, I, you know think of the strangers. It's part of what the Buddha is encouraging us and it's a high bar, but to try to bring that kind of compassion that we bring to our own loved ones to strangers and to, you know, to our enemies as well. That's good advice and thank you. Yeah, easier said than done, I know. <laughs> uh, by the way, I, I was gonna say to you, like, you know, I'm kind of an alpha male. I'm not a big person, but I'm fit and capable. <laughs> Let's put it that way. And when someone gets in my face, you know, like it happened today, I just said, I just backed off, but like, it's sometimes, you know, as a man with strength and accomplishment, I just want to, to be honest, take them out, you know, but I don't because I have too much to lose, but like, so it's of, just like, it's, it's not that easy sometimes. We're out of time, Greg. I get it. It's not that easy, but also we need to protect our own karma. It's not worth it. It's never worth it. Well, so I get it. Welcome. I'm glad you're here. Good to see everybody. I have a couple of announcements. Um, what are my announcements? My first announcement is start more meetings wherever you are, wherever you're hearing this, whether right? you're here with me tonight or you're watching it. Uh, if you can, if there's people in your, like, you know, Greg, like uh, there needs to be more meetings on Montauk, like, you know, start more, like be of service in that way. There's so many people, co you know, um, so many, we lost so many of the meetings during COVID. And they, so start, start them up, you know, make this and available. How do you do, how do you, can I ask you, how do you do that? Because I would love to do that. With all of my the boys information. Become. All of the information is on the website. On, go to the website, start a new meeting. There's a whole form format and we'll walk you through it. So that was my first, first announcement. Start more meetings. Second one was... Um, there are going to be two more refuge recovery retreat, three more this year, but one's totally sold out, right? Retreats this year. Um, the November seven day retreat, which I know is a little ways off, um, has a handful of spots left. So if you're planning to come to the seven day uh, retreat in November, register soon. It's going to sell out soon. I'm adding a three day or a weekend retreat two day, really a Friday, Saturday, Sunday in Massachusetts in early September. There's going to be a, a weekend retreat in Massachusetts in early September. I'm being vague about the dates because I'm not sure yet whether it's going to be the 9th, 10th, 11th, or 16th, 17th, 18th. But one of those two weeks in September, I'm going to have a weekend refuge retreat in Massachusetts. That's um, it's about, an outside, about an hour outside of Boston, I believe. Um, at a retreat center. So the, those of those are coming up. Keep an eye if you are on the East Coast and you want to come out to that um, September retreat. It'll be open for registration within the next week or so when I clarify the dates. Um, and um, donate, you know, be, be generous if you can. Check in with your meetings. Very few in-person meetings are donating to World Services. So if you're part of an in-person meeting, check in with the treasurer. Is it just because you're struggling to make rent uh, or what is it? But um, we, you know, we've got a lot of expenses here to, to run the Zoom, to run, the, you know, to pay rent on the office, um, to keep, you know, the, the employees compensated. So whatever the members can do and the groups can do to support World Services is deeply appreciated. Um, thank you. And I'll leave it there for tonight. Good to see everybody. Thanks for coming out. May any goodness that comes from our practice and discussion of the Buddha's Dharma be offered outward in all directions. May each one of us get as free as possible in this lifetime 
and together may we create a positive change on this planet. And see you next time.